our next guest for a very long time, in fact, going back, I think, to the dark days of the financial crisis when he wrote a lot about financial matters, James Kwok, that's K-W-A-K, for those of you who want to look him up. James Kwok is a professor at the University of Connecticut School of Law. He is a chair of the board of the Southern Center for Human Rights, and he is the author or co-author of three previous books before the one we're about to discuss. Uh, one was 13 Bankers, which was a seminal exploration of uh, the financial crisis and its aftermath, uh, co-written with Simon Johnson, The Economist, uh, and another was White House Burning, another one was The Wall Street, uh, was, uh, I'm sorry, I've lost it, but he, he wrote a bunch of books, okay. And he also uh, is the author of a new book uh, on Strong Arm Press and also available at the American Prospect called Take Back Our Party, Restoring the Democratic Legislate. Uh, I'm sorry, the Democrat, well, what's going on with me today? Re Restoring the Democratic Legacy is the subtitle. And James Kwok joins us now. So first of all, James, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honor. Oh, it's, a, it's an honor to have you. And, and about that title, let's start, I take it the old Leslie Gore title, it's my party and I'll cry if I want to, may have already been taken or, um, the uh, take back our party implies a couple things, okay? It implies that once there was a democratic party that reflected the values of people like you and me, that there's a legacy there and that it has been uh, either hijacked or usurped in some way. And I take it that implication is not accidental on your part. Yeah, I think that's exactly correct. Um, you know, when I grew up, I grew up in the 1970s and 1980s. And although times were already changing, the Democrats, you know, for my family, for a lot of people, stood for the working class, the ordinary person, the common people. Uh, they, we stood for poor people. That was the legacy of the war on poverty of Lyndon Johnson. We stood for the safety net. That was the legacy of Franklin Roosevelt. And we had a classic two-party system where the Republicans were the party of big business, you know, rich people, banks, and so on. And I think that uh, that's an important, healthy balance in the political system. And I think that what's happened, and this has been discussed many times by many people, from the late 1980s, certainly with the Clinton administration, continuing through the Obama administration and the Clinton campaign of 2016, is that the Democratic Party has really shifted. The establishment of the last quarter century has moved away from workers, unions, welfare programs, the safety net, and has become essentially the second party of capitalism. They've become the other party that believes in free markets, small government, dynamic private sector growth, and the idea that simply expanding the economy will make everyone better off. And in the book, we can talk about, about why that happened, but I, the short answer is I think that uh, that, that philosophy, that, that governmental strategy has failed. It's failed as policy. What's, what you know, we've seen just rising inequality over the past 20, 30 years. And I think it's failed as politics. I mean, if you look at the 2016 election, I don't think there's any more clear case that people no longer believe that the Democratic Party stood for them and instead they voted for a madman. Well, I, I certainly agree. but And I would say that, uh, you know, I mentioned in the introduction, James, that I've been reading you uh, since the darkest days of the financial crisis. And, you know, those of us who were writing about it, talking about it back then, uh, I feel like we were this sort of band, a small community, virtual community of people trying to kind of hold up a light and say, you know, this really isn't going well. And the the way when the Obama administration came in, some of the, the decisions it was making were did not augur well for the future. Uh, and And yet I feel somehow... I think we made significant progress since then, but I feel almost now, and I want to get your thoughts on this, as if we don't have one Democratic Party, now we have two. That the traditional role that you just described for the Republican Party has been, it's still playing the role of the party of the big business and the wealthy, but it's also got these fanatical elements of Ayn Randism and nativism and other things now prominent in it. And I feel as if the Democratic Party basically encompasses the point of views that in most other democracies 
would be the conservative and the political party, so and the uh, <laughs> liberal party, right? I mean, you you have you have uh, Democrats espousing the kind of free market ideology you're describing, and then we have others that would be more equivalent to the center left parties of Western Europe or whatever, uh, uh, espousing a larger social uh, safety net and uh, more regulation on finance and so on. But I feel that somehow we're in this odd uh, historical moment and that a book like yours is a call to say, well, let's make the Democratic Party A, a thing, which it's not, it's too amorphous <laughs> now, and B, let's make it the thing that it used to be. And I, I know that's a simplistic way of putting it, but is that a fair encapsulation of your position? It is. I mean, first of all, to your point, I think the political landscape in the United States has gotten very confusing. Uh, one symbol of this is, remember when the New York Times endorsed um, both Elizabeth Warren and Amy Klobuchar, what they said in their editorial was, you know, these are two different alternatives to Trump, essentially. Uh, what they should have said is Elizabeth Warren is a Democrat and Amy Klobuchar is a Republican and right. Donald Trump is a, is a madman. Um, so basically, we're endorsing a Democrat and a Republican. We want one of them to defeat Donald Trump. Obviously, everyone wants Donald Trump to be defeated. But yes, I think what's happened is in, in very shorthand is that the Republican Party has been taken over by conservative zealots who, with every election, get more and more uh, crazy. I mean, the idea that people like Orrin Hatch and John McCain at the end of his life and Lindsey Graham are considered reasonable senior statesman just tells you how much that party has changed. I think that, you know, certainly beginning in the 1990s, the Democratic Party essentially filled the vacuum left by the retreating Democratic Party and adopted what essentially are, you know, in my childhood would have been called moderate mainstream Republican positions, balanced budgets, free trade, uh, financial deregulation, certainly, um, you know, Immigration. Immigration used to be something that the Republican Party wanted because the business community wants wants immigration. Uh, and Obamacare, of course. So Obamacare, again, as has been said many times, was originally the brainchild of the Heritage Foundation. Right. And it was, you know, based on uh, what Mitt Romney did in Massachusetts. So so yes, I think the first move is that the new Democrats, Bill Clinton in the lead, essentially co-opted and adopted a lot of centrist or moderate Republican positions because those were, in their view, the key to electoral success. And uh, and Republicans moved to the right. And then only since the financial crisis, you know, since the financial crisis, since the Great Recession, I think those did two things. I mean, one is they exposed just the extreme levels of inequality well, economic inequality, and also the extreme levels of inequality and in access to political power. So the contrast between how the government treated uh, the big banks and how it treated homeowners faced with foreclosure, again, is, was just, uh, it, it made apparent, I think, the fact that our government works for the rich and the powerful and not for ordinary people. And, the fa and also this happened under a democratic administration. So those factors, I think, you know, laid the groundwork for Bernie Sanders. And, and I think it's largely thanks to Bernie Sanders that we, the split in the party is as evident as it is, as it is today. Remember in 2016, Elizabeth Warren decided not to run essentially because she thought there was no chance. Um, and in 2020, it's very clear. Now we may not win, we meaning the progressives, we may not win the nomination this time, but it's a distinct, a distinct possibility. So, uh, I, I, first of all, James Quack, I completely agree with that analysis. But secondly, I, I, I want to take you back to another reaction I had in reading your book and thinking about, you know, the days that you, you and Simon wrote about so well uh, in 13 Bankers, too. I, I really felt, and now I'm not given to Pollyanna-ish sort of bursts of enthusiasm, but it seemed so clear at the end, after the 2008 financial crisis, that the philosophy uh, that this wing of the Democratic Party and their Republican allies had been pushing, that of financial deregulation and so on, that of free market ideology, was finally and utterly discredited, that everybody understood that Senator Dick Durbin was right to express reservations in 1999, I guess it was, with Graham Leach Bliley and, 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 and the dismantling of Glass-Steagall and the uh, 
uh, unleashing, uh, further unleashing, because it was already underway, of uh, you know Wall Street, uh, Wall Street's ability to uh, do uh, dangerous deals of one kind or another. I really felt as if this is objectively proven by the offense of 2008. So surely, we, whatever we do, the politics of the next decade will reflect that understanding. And yet, at least, uh, please tell me if you disagree, I feel that politics of the last decade, Bernie Sanders was a phenomenon of challenging that. But if anything, Democratic politics, by and large, did not reflect that very much, which gave Donald Trump a chance to kind of steal Bernie's rhetoric about the game is rigged against you, which people intuitively understand, and uh, you know allowed him to uh, to become president. So, but I'm curious of your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good question, and it's a topic I don't I don't have a, a simple answer for it. I think a few things have happened. Um, one is, I mean, some things have happened with the party establishment, and some things have happened with the party, uh, the you know, the base, the people in the party. I think one thing is that in election after election, the Democratic Party or our 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 approach as a group is that we are desperate to win, and we feel like the only way to win is by playing to the middle. So although most people in the party probably haven't heard of the median voter theory, I think most of them probably subscribe to the median voter theory, which says that people vote for the person closest to them on the ideological spectrum. Hence, your candidate should be as close to the middle as possible. Or another way to put it is, if your candidate is off the charts to the right, you should have someone who's just slightly to the left of that. Um, and so we go into, I think that, you know, on the one hand, there are people, I think we're seeing it right now, there are people, I think, you know, Medicare for all polls at well over 50% in the, in the country, let alone the, the Democratic Party, um, even after all the attacks of the past summer. So there are many people clearly who want Medicare for all, they want free college, they want student debt relief, um, they want expanded social security benefits, but yet many of them feel like They've they've internalized they've internalized the uh, the Republican attack lines. They've internalized the idea that someone who calls himself a democratic socialist can never be president, and so they're they're willing to vote for you know Pete Buttigieg or Amy Klobuchar. I mean Amy Klobuchar. The rise of Amy Klobuchar is, is entirely explained by people who um, want to defeat Trump, are skeptical that Sanders can do it, and just need someone to vote for. Uh, I mean that that's that's what's happened in the past. Two weeks. So I think we have this schizophrenic electorate to contrast with um, the way the conservatives came to power. I mean, they they had no qualms about about saying we're going to um, support the people we stand for. I think then, secondly, you know, at the at the leadership level in the party, you have you have people whose lives and identities and fortunes are based on uh, the neoliberal ideology and the idea that. We have to embrace capitalism. We have to embrace free markets. We can't be the party of redistribution. We can't be the party of, of welfare. Um, those were lessons they learned in the 1980s. I'm not saying they were correct lessons, but that's what that's how they interpreted the 1980s. And you know, when you've been saying something for 20 years, it's very difficult to say that you're wrong. It's very difficult to just exit the scene and let other people take over. Yes, the fact that the the fact that the same people who were all in for Hillary Clinton in 2016 still have influential roles in the party is is staggering. Uh, this would not happen in the private sector. If you are responsible for the greatest failure of your lifetime, you do not get to keep your job. And yet the way the party and the think tanks, you know, the National Committee, the Congressional and Senatorial Committee, the think tank network, the way they work, uh, the same people are still in power. So I think there's certainly an institutional element to it to it as well. And then one last thing, which we've discussed online, is, is the role of President Obama. President Obama is beloved by the Democratic base, despite um, essentially having governed as a moderate Republican. You could say the same thing about Clinton, Bill Clinton, who was very popular at the end of his presidency. These are charismatic men who can give speeches like nobody else. And um, they command a lot of loyalty in the party, even among people who will say, you know, the deportations were wrong, Afghanistan was wrong, failing to help homeowners was wrong. They still believe in Barack Obama's Democratic Party. 
and uh, that I think that is that is a struggle for us. So again, we're talking with James Kwok, whose new book is Take Back Our Party, Restoring the Democratic Legacy. And you know, a lot of Democrats, you've touched on something that I think is a barrier to, uh, and you talk about this in the book too, but it, it, it's going to be a barrier to restructuring the party along the lines that you or I might want to do it. And, and that is number one, the affection uh, uh, and loyalty so many Democrats feel towards Barack Obama because it's going to be necessary to challenge some of his policies. They let the bankers uh, go unpunished, put the same people in place. The, the five or six largest banks are even larger now. We could go down the list. 1,200 state seats lost during the Obama presidency. The House of Representatives lost, the Senate lost. It has not been, it was not a winning strategy by any measure, but Obama himself and uh, many of the operatives that supported him and Hillary Clinton remain in place. So, and, and you make a compelling case for the bad policy, the bad politics that this represents, uh, but it leaves us with, and, and you know, we're not taking the book necessarily in the outline in which it's written, but this leaves us with the question of, well, how do we actually, you make the case for taking back the party, but that leaves open the question, you know, how do we do that? Yeah, well, so there are two, there are two uh, aspects to that question, and I have an answer for one, and I have less of an answer for the second. So the last chapter of the book ends, is is the first answer, which is I try to lay out a new economic platform. Now, economics are not the only issue that that a party has to deal with. Um, you know, but I'll say a couple of things. I mean, I think that the the long term of the uh, the neoliberals of the Clinton Obama party was mainly economic. Um, I mean, uh, you know, there were other distasteful things. Criminal justice certainly was one. Um, the the opposition of the party leadership to gay marriage until they were absolutely forced into it by the states that was that was an embarrassment, but I think that the distinguishing uh, turn in the party in the 1990s was toward free market economics. Uh, the idea was, you know, essentially, as I say in the book, the Republican line was we should let that markets be completely free and unregulated and everyone will get rich. The Democratic line was we should let markets operate as well as they can, which means sometimes we need a light touch regulation. Um, and I think that, that that is what I say has failed, certainly economically, when you look at the, uh, the rise of inequality and economic insecurity in this country. And I think also it's failed politically because this was once the heart of the democratic message. The heart of the democratic message is we stand up for people who don't have a lot of money. Um, we stand up for unions, we help people unionize, we have safety net programs. Uh, we, we, are, we are the party of, of the working class. And that was the, that was the um, basis for our identity for a long time. Then in the 1980s and 1990s, the Democrats ran away from that identity. They didn't like being associated with factory workers and with poor people. And I think by 2016, we had no economic identity left. We were a party that said, essentially, when it came to economics, we're really smart. We know economics really well. You should trust us. Um, and we're better at managing markets and managing the economy than Republicans. So I think the short answer to half of your question is uh, we should recognize that what people worry about is they don't worry about economic growth overall. They worry about health care and they worry about retirement and they worry about education and they worry about, about child care. And we should make people make sure people have those things. Um, you know, we should have Medicare for all, obviously. We should have free college. We should have free uh, pre-K and so on. Um, and I think that will, I think that's the right policy. I think that's the best way to help the most people. I also think that it is completely differentiated from the Republicans uh, on a political basis. I say I, I don't have a good answer to the second half of your question because the second half of your question is really, well, how do we actually, given this divide in the party today and this battle that's going on right now, how do we, how do we win that battle? Um, we have two very good spokespeople right now, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. I know I, I respect both of them enormously. I know some people prefer one or the other. I don't want to talk about that issue now. And they've been making the case very well. 
And I think on a lot of the issues, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, we have we have clear majority support within the party. Uh, Medicare for all, certainly um, expanded Social Security and so on. Uh, we are fighting against uh, an entrenched establishment. I think that's, that's very clear. It's not just the party itself. The media, it's the media as well. Um, I mean, there were lots of jokes on Twitter, but it's a serious thing when when Bernie Sanders wins New Hampshire and, and everyone says the big story is Amy Klobuchar. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, in, in Iowa, when all the headlines say um, Buttigieg wins and uh, Bernie Sanders got more votes in, vote, in both votes. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the Times wins articles then about, uh, you know, essentially how the moderate votes, if you add up the moderates, they, you know, they had more votes than Bernie Sanders and so on. So the, the idea that the idea that socialism is bad, and the, first of all, Bernie Sanders, I don't think is a socialist. He chooses to call himself a democratic socialist, uh, which he has every right to. But, you know, for anyone who studied the history of socialism, uh, what he what he favors is less socialist than what most of Western Europe has today. Um, but be that as it may, the idea that, you uh, Redistribution is bad. Socialism is bad. Uh, this will all be bad for the economy, and you know billionaires will stop working. These ideas are deeply entrenched. Again, not only in the party leadership, um, but in the media as well. And I, I do not have a good answer for tactically how to overcome that that uh, challenge. I will say, demographics are in our favor. I mean, if you look at the 18 to 29 uh, age group, um, they're they're to the left of Bernie Sanders. And uh, I don't think their opinions are going to change as they get older. It's certainly, um, given given the economy we live in, I don't think they're going to become rich, fat, and happy capitalists. No, I, so time is on their side. But uh, but this year, I think, is up in the air. Yeah, and that gets to uh, and uh, that gets to exactly the last set of questions uh, I wanted to ask you before we go. And again, James Kwok is the author of the book uh, "Take Back Our Party: uh, Restoring the Democratic Legacy." And uh, I guess that has to do with this. When uh, you wrote this book, clearly you must have had some thoughts about who the audience might be. Were you trying to, let's say, influence the influencers, people who might uh, you know, be less inclined to resist this kind of change going forward? Were you trying to sort of fortify the uh, people who already feel this way. What what do you picture as the audience for this book? Yeah. Well, so unfortunately, I think it's difficult to change minds these days. Um, that's not to say no minds can be changed, but I think it's difficult. I think that, uh, let me just step back for a second. My previous book is called Economism, and Economism is about the fallacy of, of relying on very simplistic economic models to answer lots and lots of questions. The idea being that if you really understand economics and study economics, you learn that the world is much more complicated than simple supply and demand charts. And I wrote that book for, essentially for progressives who do not want to agree with the classical economics line on various questions like free trade or the minimum wage and so on, but didn't feel equipped to argue with someone who makes an economics argument. I wanted to say, look, this, it's not that complicated. It's actually pretty simple. And the people who say it's just economics 101, they're wrong. So the reason I said that is I had something of a similar um, motivation here. You know, I don't think Neera Tandon is going to read my book and change her mind about the way the world works, just to take one example, nor is Amy Klobuchar. Um, I think that there are there are a lot of people who are progressive. I, I, let me step back a second. I think, I mean, a, a main our target audience is the people I spoke about a few minutes ago, people who want Medicare for all and they want free college, uh, but they still think that we need to, you know, for tactical reasons, we need to have a moderate, we need to have moderate candidates. We can't be socialists and so on. Um, what I wanted to say is, is look, first of all, these are the right uh, economic choices. You know, if someone says to you, uh, you know, if someone says that we can't afford Medicare for all because, you know, the it's the the federal budget will get too big you know i wanted to say look that's just wrong i mean what, all, what matters at the end of the day is how much we spend for help um on health care whether or not it goes through the federal government is a, is an administrative issue so i wanted to say yes you're right this is what we need and then i also wanted to say and this is good politics as well 
because I think that there are there are, there are many people who again, want these things, think that those are the right policies for a country, but are afraid that they're political losers. And I wanted to say, no, the strategy is we need to stand for something. We need to have bold ideas that people care about, and we need to communicate them forcefully. And I mentioned this a couple of times in the book. This is what the conservatives did. They had very bold ideas beginning in the 1950s. They did not compromise on those ideas. They communicated them very forcefully, and they won. They won the battle of ideas, and that's why we're in the in the deep hole we are in today. So I wanted to say, uh, yes, the you know what I call the doctrine of growth and opportunity, the idea that if we make the pie bigger, everyone will, everyone will be better off. That was the Clinton doctrine, that was the Obama doctrine. I wanted to say, yes, that sounded good. And it sounded, you know, uh, post-partisan and inclusive and all those, all those happy things. But as politics, it failed. Um, we lost our differentiation as a party. Um, we became indistinguishable from the Republicans. And because we didn't actually do anything for ordinary people, they eventually stopped trusting us. So I think that what I want to say is, yes, these policies are good for America, but they're also good politics. They're good for the Democratic Party. And they are the path back to power. The path back to power is not to be uh, moderate Republicans in today's environment. So I couldn't help but think, uh, James Kwok, as, we, as you were talking, uh, about a, a couple things, a couple quotes. One of them may be e, e completely uh, off base. It, it's really a paraphrase. It became known as a quote, apocryphally attributed to Harry Truman, who actually said something more tortured and complicated. But it got, it came down through the folkways as, in a race between a Republican and a Republican, the Republican wins every time, <laughs> which is much pithier. Unfortunately, it's not what uh, Truman said. But okay. <laughs> um, but I I also thought of uh, of those uh, behavioral those brutal uh, behavioral science experiments where dogs are given an electric shock when they try to cross a cage and they give up trying. You know, uh, I feel as if too many Democrats have uh, want the things that you and I you know would agree. And also want, uh, just feel, well, you know, we're, all we're going to get is another Amy Klobuchar. So, okay, I'll take Amy, I'll take it in the Amy Klobuchar package this time, or the Pete Buttigieg package. Or, and yeah. and I, I feel that, you know, uh, but I'll, I'll give you the last word. I feel like, in a sense, you know, FTR said uh, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. I feel as if despair is the only thing we have, to, the biggest thing we have to despair about right now on Team Democrat, but I will give you the last word on the subject if you care to take it. Yeah, well, I think, you know, in the long term, um, in the long term, the only thing that matters is the long term. Um, I think that the dynamic of American politics in recent decades has been when the Republicans are in power, they actually achieve things. Uh, they lower taxes, they reduce regulations, uh, and so on. When Democrats are in party, we pretty much hold the line. Um, we don't uh, I mean, in some ways we make things worse, like with welfare reform. In other ways, we make things a little bit better. We don't um, really shift the way the political and economic system work. Um, and I think that, you know, if we, you know, if we elect another moderate, certainly that person will be better than Donald Trump. But I don't think it'll change the long term dynamics of the political system. I would, you know, I would vote for Amy Klobuchar in a general election. There's absolutely no question about that. Uh, but the day after the election, I would continue trying to push for a, you know, a progressive takeover of the party. Because if we want to actually, uh, if we don't want to continue this one way ratchet system in which things stay the same under Democrats and they get worse under Republicans, uh, we have to have a different kind of Democrat. I, I think you're absolutely right. You know, if, if a Republican and a Republican won, the Republicans win. And, uh, it's, you know, we don't want to have a, a um, an election between a moderate Republican and a fascist Republican, which is what we might end up with this fall. Certainly, we would I wouldn't vote for the fascist, but uh, that's not a long-term solution to the challenges that our country faces. So I take it you're not going out this afternoon and volunteering for Michael Bloomberg's campaign? <laughs> uh, Michael Bloomberg, if, if I could have another minute to talk about of Bloomberg. Course. I mean, Bloomberg, Bloomberg is... <sighs> I will say, I will certainly say on many policies, he's certainly much better than Trump. Um, but I will say Michael Bloomberg, if he were to be the president, that would be a, a, uh, 
a very powerful sign of the the problems facing our party and our our country, right? I mean, the the, the fundamental issue uh, is the entrenchment of wealth and power and the domination of our of our political system by the interest of people who want to have more power and make more money. And if Michael Bloomberg succeeds in buying uh, the Democratic nomination, that will, again, that will just be a, a further sign of how broken the political system is. I mean, one may hope that it would be a wake-up call. Of course, many things uh, should already have been wake-up calls. So whether whether we would respond is, uh, is open to question. Well, uh, I, I couldn't say it better myself, although I have uh, been outspoken on this subject, as I believe you may know. But uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. James Kwok, again, I always spell my guests' uh, names, K-W-A-K, -K, professor Thank at the you. University of Connecticut School of Law. The book is Take Back Our Party, Restoring the Democratic Legacy. Thanks for writing it, James, and thanks for coming on the program. Thank you for having me.